I'd like to uh, call to order the Shockley School Board regular business meeting for August 26, 2024. Tiffany, can you please do the roll? Erlingen? Here. Peterson? Here. Smith? Here. Aldridge? Here. Johnson? Here. Mohammed? Valdez? Here. Shania? Here. Michelle? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's staying cool and dry later. Uh, we'll try to uh, move things along here so we get out before the, uh, the storm. Uh, first on our agenda is uh, our Saber Fry. And uh, item 3.1 is uh, the Environmental Learning Center Eagle Scout Project. And here to present is uh, Principal Kristen Ellis from Red Oak Elementary and her guest Luke Sather, or Sather, oh, one of those. <laughs> Welcome. I assume that's proud parents as well. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Principal Ellis over at Red Oak, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, upcoming sophomore Luke, who has done a beautiful job with his Eagle Scout project at Red Oak Elementary School, as you can see on the screen. Um, Luke has chosen Red Oak to host his beautiful outdoor classroom. Um, had a chance to present it to the entire staff this morning at our welcome back, um, and everyone was in awe and a huge accolades go out to Luke and his family for all their support not only for this project but ongoing um, during their tenure here in Shakopee. So with that I'm going to let Luke talk about this project. Yeah so my name is Luke I'm going to my sophomore year. Um, I went to Red Oak so that's kind of why I chose my project here. Um, so yeah so my total like man hours for my work days was around 220. Um, and I raised about $4,800 for the project, which mostly came from like community organizations like the Shakopee and Savage Lions Club and uh, Legion. Um, my work day was a couple weeks ago. Um, I had around 30 volunteers that consisted of my troop and some friends and family and Chad, who was a very, <laughs> very big help with the easel. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so as you can see, there's benches, there's 17 of them, um, and they all flip to a picnic table or a desk or whatever, and um, they're all movable, so. There's also two play tables and two play kitchens. You can't really see in any of the pictures, but they're fairly small, so whatever, <laughs> kids want to play in them or whatever. Um, so yeah, and then there's the in-ground easel, which has locked doors and is a whiteboard and corkboard. So. And then with the easels, what did you create? Yeah, did so I also made four caddies, which had um, some dry erase markers and eraser, like so, uh, the cleaning solution, um, along with the key and some magnets. So, yeah, that's really all I got if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Chair, if I may. So, uh, what inspired you? What gave you this vision? And why did you choose this project among so, anything else you could have done? Yeah, so I pretty much heard about this project and um, I came to the school and talked to some of the teachers and they told me that they wanted to have some sort of outdoor classroom. So I kind of, you know, just kind of came up with kind of the benches and the easels and stuff and I brought it to them and they approved it. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, really, really impressive. Uh, yeah, my, my kids went to Red Oak, and so yeah, I went in those entrances all the time. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, I can just picture that's just an amazing transformation of that space. It's wonderful. I love I love the fact that they, that they turn in picnic tables. I just think it's yeah. such a wonderful mm -hmm. use of you have this, and then you have another completely. Uh, different usage of the same material. It's just well done. Congratulations. It was a really fun surprise. And 
Luke, um, correct me if I'm wrong, this project and the work that you did with it really coincides with your academy that you're in, is that right? Yes, so yeah, I'm in the Engineering and Manufacturing Academy at the high school, so awesome. Yeah, I felt fortunate enough. We were over at Red Oak this morning and got to see this. And then, uh, you know, Ed Zemeth, who's in charge of, you know, he's our supervisor of operations, building, and grounds. And he and I were having a discussion about how cool just the, the construction of it, the design, and uh, really, really well done. And, uh, you know, they, they look fantastic, professionally done, high quality, and, uh, and kind of unique in design. So a lot of thought went into it. And, uh, you know, just a, a really, really well thought out project, well done, that will serve our, our Red Oak uh, students and uh, community there, um, hopefully a for a of, long time to come. There's a lot of personalized shout outs in the benches as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you have one dedicated to the Red Oak PTO, you have one um, stamping your hard work on there, um, a lot of your sponsors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of great, a lot of great work. And it's all free with lumber, so it lasts for a long time. <laughs> Great work. Next on our agenda is item 3.2 staff 20 or 2024 and 25 staff years of service recognition. And here to present is our assistant superintendent, Jim Kosich. Yeah, I would just say that one of the unique and, and beautiful things about Shakopee is the staff recognition every year at our back to school event. And this year we will be honoring 26 teachers uh, on 20 years of service, nine teachers on 25 years of service. Six on 30, and then we'll say Tom Schlepper's name for his 35 years of service. And so this is a preview of the video that will be shared with, no? Just, oh, just that, all right. Uh, so anyway, no, just wanted to, to fill you in on that. And again, uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing that as part of our back to school uh, on Thursday morning, and you'll all be invited to that. And uh, it's just, a, it's, it's fun to watch the staff support the staff. And, and really, uh, really get into it. And our HR team does a very nice job of honoring these folks. And Tiffany, the list of that's in the uh, education forward. Yes, it's well, also on the board agenda. Yes, the board agenda. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. I look forward to going there on Thursday and uh, congratulating them. Thank you, Jim. Next on our agenda is item four, the consideration of the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Brophy and a second by Aldrich. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next on our agenda is item five, public comment. This is the time where members of the public can participate in the meeting without being part of the meeting agenda. A member of the public may address the board on an agenda topic or on another topic. We allocate a total of 15 minutes for public comment at this meeting. Each individual speaker may speak for up to two and a half minutes. The sign up period for public comment has been conducted online and in person prior to this evening's meeting. No one has signed up for public comment prior to this evening's meeting. We will move on to the next item on the agenda. Next on our agenda is item six, the consent items. You can see we have several personnel items, uh, previous board meeting minutes, bills, wires, and donations. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, A motion by Aldrich and a second by Valdez. Any discussion? I just want to point out uh, the donations and there's a significant amount of donations that our district has received for a lot of different events uh, in our district to kick off the year. So just want to thank everyone in our community for supporting our school district. All set. Thank you. Uh, 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next on our agenda is item 7.1, legislative update. And here we have our distinguished guests uh, representing District 54A, Representative Brad Tacky. Welcome, Brad. Hello. Can we just start? Yeah, please. You got it. The floor is yours. <laughs> all right, awesome. Well, hey, thank you very much, everybody, for all of your work. Uh, I, having been uh, locally elected for some years now, understand exactly that, uh, everything that uh, goes on and how much everybody works to uh, talk to folks, whether you're at the uh, grocery store or at Pablo's or wherever you're at, and uh, chatting with folks. Thank you very much, uh, including student board members. What you guys do is awesome. So thank you very much. Uh, Everybody for being here and doing your work. Um, I uh, am proud of the work we've been doing in the legislature. So we uh, are done, uh, nearly done with our second year of the biennium. Uh, this is the second year we're, uh, we're in the uh, campaigning mode now, and so we are very much door knocking and talking to lots and lots of folks. Um, knocked on most everybody's door here uh, at one point, whether you're home or not. But uh, it, uh, we, our team has. Uh, 25,000 doors uh, this summer already, and uh, I'm over 2,500. The number one thing that comes up is education, and so it is the number one thing that is on uh, Shakopee residents' mind and what everybody talks about on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really important that uh, uh, we continue to work uh, work hard and get things done. So this past uh, budget cycle and this past biennium, we have invested more uh, in schools than Minnesota has ever done before. It's uh, Shakopee, I think the number was uh, between 15 and $16 million more coming to Shakopee uh, this uh, this year because of the budgets that we passed and what we've done. It was a significant amount of money to the state side of things. And um, there are, uh, I understand that uh, uh, some folks who may have been presented to the board previously have different opinions as to how this works. And that's great. That's uh, how the process works. And that's how we all move forward. So what, uh, Minnesota is uh, without a doubt the number one place to raise a family in the United States and in the world. We are ranked high uh, on every single metric, what, uh, what we're doing here in Minnesota, um, unless you are a family of color, you're a family of color, uh, then we rank toward the bottom of things. And we as a state have to work on that. And it is really important that we are uh, pushing to make sure that we're uh, uh, reducing and eliminating that uh, uh, the education gaps that we have and the, um, those pieces so that everybody has times to succeed and so there are a significant amount of discussion around uh, how we handled the budget this past year and how that uh, works and how that moves forward and there was a lot of things from the legislative perspective that we wanted to get done to make sure that we are uh, reducing that massive gap that is uh, required and incumbent upon us to to change and throughout the state and so it uh, has different impacts on different districts how, how people work and how how things uh happen and move forward and not everybody's gonna be happy with it but uh we are uh we've been dealing with significant underfunding from the state level uh for decades now and so we are um not going to be able to fix all the problems in one fell swoop we're not going to be able to do that and so our goal uh this past year was to make sure that we were investing in future generations of Minnesotans and that uh, kids will have the opportunity and the ability to succeed more than they ever have um, with this funding that we put forward on things. So there's a lot of uh, pieces that way um, and it is uh, again really important to Shakopee residents that we that we do this we continue to work forward. So it's not a, a one year and done kind of thing whatsoever. This is a commitment that we've all made for making sure that we are funding education and increasing that uh, forward the uh, uh, finance chair was door knocking with me tonight and she made sure Brian you need to make sure that everybody knows that we have done less than a third of what we need to do in order to get Minnesota back to where it needs to be on education funding so we've got a ways to go on there uh, and where you go because we know that when we're not investing in education at the state level that all falls below the property taxes because it uh, we, we need to pay teachers in order make sure that our teachers are uh, well compensated and they stay here and they don't go to other districts. We need to make sure that our parents are uh, adequately compensated and so they don't go, uh, so they don't leave the profession and they don't go somewhere else. Um, and we have that. And so it's uh, really important that we continue to do that funding and moving that forward 
board. So uh, I'm not on any of the education committees, so I'm not directly involved in those, but we uh, had great opportunity. Uh, Chair Joachim heard our bill, it was House File 5004 um, this uh, spring, which uh, we had uh, Dale Anderson came and uh, testified, and uh, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent were there as well, and uh, we talked about QCOMP and making sure that we are um, funding QCOMP well, so we have QCOMP and uh, all the facilities and making sure that we're increasing that because Shakopee gets, we miss out on millions of dollars of funding that we as a district should be getting. And so we're gonna work to continue and making sure that uh, Shakopee gets included in that. There are different paths and different ways that people want to make that happen. Um, and I very much care about education across the state. I also care very much more about Shakopee. And so uh, we'll continue to work on making sure that we that passed in this next budget cycle. So this uh, uh, past session was more of a uh, primer on the way to where we're going uh, in the future and how we can get that uh, done. And so uh, just making sure I don't miss a ton of my notes that I wanted to hit. Uh, last thing is that I am very involved in the transportation world on things. So vice chair of the transportation committee currently. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't think about how this impacts uh, education, but uh, it is making sure that we, we put significant amounts of money into safe routes to schools so that people have access to that and to districts across the state have access to getting kids from point A to point B and making sure we're, we're getting to our schools um, uh, safely and making sure that we're getting there as well as uh, MVTA is just uh, starting on the third as uh, changing their routes so the transit access is um, the high school for the first time and so I think it's really important that we have uh, those pieces in place and we're also increasing the amount of transit availability soon in the next uh, 18 months or so there's going to be a service called transit uh, MVTA connect that will be more of an on-call public transit version of uber and lyft kind of thing um, that will be available to further add the ability to uh, for people to get back and forth uh, to uh, events and for kids to get home from school uh, and things like that. So it's going to be a really important thing. And I look forward to those uh, partnerships and that work increasing as it goes forward. So um, I think if anybody has questions, happy to answer any questions folks have. And uh, again, I just appreciate everybody's support and uh, taking time to uh, chat tonight. that was asked of Representative Baker. I was not at that meeting, but I watched it at home because I had COVID, so I couldn't be here. Um, so that question is, if you could reverse a couple of mandates that have been imposed on our schools, which hinder some of the money that our schools get, um, I shouldn't say hinder, but uh, takes away from the general fund and allows, it puts restraints on where we can spend it. Uh, what would they be? Um, so what I will say to that is that everybody across the state has very different needs and very different perspectives. And as something is really important on the Iron Range, may not be as important to us here in the suburbs. Um, so like we have a significant amount of uh, money that went into uh, like a scale priority and something that the district uh, is involved with a lot is mental health and making sure that we have uh, more uh, counselors and more uh, folks available to kids, uh, who students who need access to mental health who don't have any other way to get it. Um, that is something that's a lot more important to us here in the suburbs uh, than it is in other districts that already are fully funding their mental health services on their own kind of thing. So I um, am not gonna say one thing or another that uh, should or shouldn't be one way or another because it was all a big package and all a big negotiated package as to who is important and we couldn't uh, uh, about what is important and we couldn't have gotten anything passed if it weren't for a big uh, package on education to make sure that we kept uh, everything going forward to get that significant uh, increase into education and so with that on uh, the uh, flip side of that a lot of the things that are um, and I work really closely with uh, Representative Baker from 54B. He and I work together on a, like QCOMP and a 
at all facilities BC and I work together on that. We work together on a lot of different issues. I take a fundamental uh, disagreement with the mandates side of things as to the fact that it is uh, uh, just mandates on on districts. There's a lot of things, like I said, that we, we have to get done as a state and uh, Shakopee is a really diverse school district. I want to make sure that we are closing those gaps and making that work. So uh, exactly um, mandates that we can get rid of. Um, I, there's a reason for all of them to be in there and then some of them are specific to other districts and some of them are specific to us. The other question I had was, and we know that the next legislative session is budget year, which is a significant uh, uh, part of a school district planning for the future of the next couple of years uh, from a budgetary standpoint. Um, I know that there's a inflation index that was passed with the last budget year that school districts will automatically get um, with each budget year. Uh, what do you foresee happening on top of that? From you know, typically school districts have gotten last time it was four and two on the formula. Years past it's been two and two. Mm -hmm. What do you foresee happening? Um, if you could look at a crystal ball, what would we get on top of that inflation calculator? Yeah, I would take. Uh, I think what we have attempted to do uh, over the course of uh, the last few biennium are pretty clear as to what we want to do, and so. Obviously, November 5th will have a massive impact on what happens and what doesn't happen. Uh, in uh, 2019, we proposed five and five on the formula uh, for increases, and uh, our uh, GOP friends in the Senate proposed it. I think it was a half and a half, or maybe a quarter and a quarter. Um, and it's very different uh, values and ways of moving forward on it. So it all depends. Uh, the Senate is up for grabs, and the House is up for grabs, and it all depends on who ends up with what. But if we to end up with a trifecta again, it would not be out of the realm for us to be five and five on the formula, even on top of uh, uh, including and on top of the exactly how that split would work. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what we're going to be going for is uh, large increases in education funding because we need to pay teachers, we need to pay parents, we need to make sure that uh, we can repair roofs everywhere in the state and that we're able to do those kinds of things. And so that is. Uh, that is there, and I know there have been, um, I don't know, somebody else can add, it just reminded me of another question. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to ask this question, but I'll maybe preempting someone or not, but uh, with unemployment uh, insurance, that has been um, extremely successful in helping people live uh, their lives and pay their bills and do a good job of, uh, of uh, compensating folks who need to stay home with their kids for the summer and where everything's at, and so uh, that, um, has been utilized significantly less than what it was budgeted at, and so there's more money for that moving forward. So the third year, um, it's budgeted for two years currently, but there's enough money to have a third year, so that third year will be paid for, so that'll uh, um, change how your guys' budget works. Um, so that won't have to be picked up, and then moving into the future in the tails on things, um, we have 50% uh, of all that unemployment uh, is picked up through special ed, and so uh, that is all there as well. So there's a lot of work that has to be done and, and move forward. That is uh, not an issue that's going to come up as some are really concerned about a year, year three of the unemployment insurance being part of um, the piece there. So um, it's uh, we if my folks are in charge, uh, we will have massive investments in education. I just want to add one comment but before I forget. Transportation, appreciative of the work that you've done with, with the transit here in Shakopee. Um, I represent Shakopee on Southwest Metro's board and I know that Southwest Metro has um, uh, benefited from some of those changes and allowing transportation to get students from just even our district to Southwest Metro for the services that they need. Um, but as well as Southwest Metro, um, also has international teachers that they come to the United States they don't have a vehicle they don't have a mode of transportation and I know that our new superintendent is working very closely with them to get transportation as a result of this uh, bus service and BTA uh, to help get our teachers international teachers that are coming in, and that are here right. uh, to our district and not relying upon employees for transportation to work every day right yeah so I that's, think that's great I think they're massive opportunities so if uh, 
everything, it's too early to speculate, but if everything were to line up the way I hope it would line up uh, over the course of the next, uh, we'll say, 72 days, I think it is, um, there's a good shot uh, that I will be chair of the Transportation Committee. Um, and if that does happen, then that is one of the main major things that I want to work on is um, those connections for local folks to be able to use uh, transit a lot better in the suburbs, as well as make sure we have access to funding for a lot more safe local routes. Because if you look at uh, the uh, city's uh, experiment they did by uh, Pearson over there, uh, by Sweeney, sorry, by Sweeney uh, this past uh, year, like there are really, really solid um, safety improvements we can make. And as a state, I want to make sure that we're pushing those kinds of things so that uh, transit works better and safety works better on, on roads. Thank you. Debbie? Well, and I asked this question. Uh, did you have questions? No. Go ahead. No, yeah. please. Oh, oh. So I was uh, listening and I heard you mention about um, POC families and how it's obviously something that's very underfunded. It's something, as a POC person, it's something that I've experienced and I've seen and deal with. Um, my, my, one, my question would be though, um, since, as you know, between POC ethnic groups, needs, are, needs vary between every group, right? Uh, what would be like a solution or a plan that would try to balance having a blanket-like solution versus more than like specific? Because obviously you can't have either or. Um, as uh, Member Peterson was alluding to, like we were pretty specific on, right. on some things. Yeah. Uh, I was very specific on the, like uh, ethnic studies, for right. example, and making sure that we got ethnic studies uh, as a requirement to make sure that everybody understands. Like a lot of folks would do absolutely call that a mandate, um, and it is a mandate, and it's really important. It doesn't have to be either of those things. And so um, we have a lot of work. So. Uh, Make sure that everybody has access to school, so to not school, to uh, meals, so that no one is going to school hungry is a huge equalizer on things. Uh, making sure that we have transportation access is another big one that I'm obviously working on. Uh, driver's licenses for all was also huge, and making sure that uh, people are um, able, no matter documentation status, to get uh, kids to and from school safely, and that everybody's gone through all of the the training and making sure that everybody is able to do that without fear uh, or we significantly less fear that way as well so there's there are a lot of things that we've been working on um, and there are also a lot of things that uh, haven't really kicked in yet and that have a long way to go before they're going to fully realize like I talked about generations of, of students in Minnesota will benefit from what we did when we put it in place and so I don't know if I answered your question well enough yeah, no, um, yeah. but there's a it's a there's a lot uh, that we've been working on. I'm super proud of that work because it's a huge priority of ours to make sure that we're doing better. It's not perfect, it's not great, uh, but I I hope that people are recognizing that uh, better is a really good next step. Yeah, I apologize for my, I apologize for my question, but thank you. Uh, so I, yeah, I asked the same question of uh, Representative Kirkman, uh, he presented. Uh, and spoiler alert, it's a funding question, right? So uh, on our agenda, we've got a, a capital projects levy, we affectionately refer to the technology levy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this goes back to 2015, so we're renewing uh, And this is kind of in that local control space where it needs to go, you know, in front of uh, you know, older approved, uh, in this case, renewal. Uh, we could make a case in 2015 that maybe technology was discretionary. I don't know that anyone would argue that that's true today. And this isn't just devices in the hands of our students and creating you know, curriculum and classroom experience. Um, it's safety, it's security, it's cyber security, it's all of those things. What's your perspective on letting local control, or in cases of like operating levies, be able to let the board decide if that could be renewed as opposed to having to go back for a voter approved uh, response? Um, or just including that in other funding um, mechanisms? Yeah, I think that we were pretty clear on the fact of that we need to continue giving local, more local control on how we handle uh, education spending. Like I, I think that the changes that we made on referendums and how that uh, moving forward will be different. I think that's a very clear signal as to where we feel about that. But also, we need to make sure that all of these funding mechanisms are not falling solely on 
property taxes. Like it's a really bad plan for the state of Minnesota for that to be falling on property taxes. Like right? we we fund education for the state with an extremely uh, with a progressive tax system, and that makes sure that the people who are benefiting the most pay the most into the system. And so uh, folks that are low income, middle class, uh, pay their fair share. Um, and when we put it on property taxes, it very much hits uh, hits those folks harder than it hits uh, folks that are in the uh, uh, higher income levels who are benefiting from educating our kids. So we want to make sure that there's a balance in there, that uh, it's not all falling to property taxes to do these important things and make sure our schools are safe, um, that that is coming out of our, our progressive income tax system. Uh, so the corporations have a piece of that pie and making that everybody is, is paying their fair share into Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to answer quicker, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Uh, we'll give Dr. Revin the last word here. Yeah, they give it to me to wrap things up, so. Uh, um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you. You know, Representative Tabke really does a, a great job in terms of being responsive and in terms of, you know, regularly checking in with us and more importantly, listens. Uh, and I would say for a legislator who is not on an education committee does a really, really good job of, of being in tune because, you know, Shakti Public Schools is a very important part of our community and also does a great job connecting us with, uh, you know, the leadership there and even, you know, Heather Edelson, the author of the READ Act. And, you know, so we, we feel really good about that, appreciate that. Uh, you already touched on, you know, efforts in terms of QCOMP and alternate facilities where we feel left out uh, of funding that other districts very similar to us receive. Very appreciative on short notice with uh, when, you know, Shakopee Valley News went out of business. You know, the law at that time said, hey, we had to go find another paper. We were looking in Burnsville, Waconia, other places. Really appreciate the bipartisan effort and support there to get us and a couple other districts in the same spot. The ability to post our minutes online and do those things. So thank you for, you know, Literally, you know, picking up the phone we call, checking in when there's things, trying to find better ways forward, and and even on some of those things, taking a long-term approach. You know, it, it's you know sometimes you're, you're setting the groundwork for the future, and uh, that doesn't go unnoticed, and and uh, I certainly appreciate it. So thanks for that. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Brad. Anything else? I just want to say one last thing of uh, thanking these two as well for um, we're working really closely with uh, folks who live on the back stretch of Canterbury Park on uh, access to healthcare and making sure that they are able to make good healthy decisions in their lives. And uh, they uh, responded way, way quicker than I ever would have expected uh, anyone in an institution like a school district. Uh, I don't mean that negatively. I just mean it's really hard to turn the ship a lot of times and get some things done. And uh, they came out right away and we're working on making sure to get uh, these kids that are um, may or may not have access to some of the services that they need to have uh, into the Shockley School District and uh, working on ways where we can help them uh, because the, the way they work is it's more of a migrant lifestyle and they're here for the fall, they go to another state for the winter and then they come back here in the spring and so it impacts our schools and working to capture those kids and make sure that they have a solid education uh, consistent education no matter where they're at and uh, they read in the district really really uh, quickly set forward once uh, everyone saw the need and understood what was going on to uh, how we can get that done together and, and moving all that forward so it was really uh, great so very appreciative of that work thank you thank you thank you Brad appreciate it Next in our agenda is item 7.2, American Indian Education Planning Update. And here to present is our American Indian Education Coordinator, Justine Vogel. Welcome. Thank you. Bujul Kinawea, Vanesi Ikweya Indigu, Justine Vogel, Indigenous Cause. Hi, everyone. My name is Justine Vogel, um, and I am a tribal member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Thank you for having me, Chair Smith, School Board, and Dr. Redmond. Um, I'm so excited and looking forward to this next school year, and I really love working with you all, our students and families, and our staff as well. 
Um, so tonight, I'll provide kind of an overview of my plans for this upcoming school year and our commitments to continue to support our students. Um, this includes our goals for student participation, um, some ideas for family engagement, both inside and outside of the classroom, and then our progress on some other recommendations from our Parent Advisory Committee. Um, so a little bit about our students and community. Um, within the borders of Minnesota, there are uh, 11 tribal nations, um, consisting of seven Anishinaabe nations and four Dakota nations, with the Shakopee, Mede, Wakantawan, Dakota, Nation, also known as Shakopee Medawakanton Sioux Community, um, being the closest in relation to us. Um, displayed here are those tribes' 11 flags of all 11 nations in Minnesota. Um, with your support, th those are going to be showcased in the common area at the high school. Um, so we just got our box in. Our kids have been unwrapping them. You might have seen, seen them at the smudge base opening. Um, so as of today, my native student, student count numbers are 245. Um, that'll ebb and flow a little bit. Some students um, might be having the wrong demographics within Infinite Campus. We have some move-ins, moves out, move-outs. So that might change throughout the year. Um, but we still have 28 tribal nations represented. Um, so kind of in comparison, uh, there are 574 tribal nations recognized by the federal government and another 400 without that federal recognition. So we've got a big chunk and even more that come from out of state than in state. Um, so a little bit about our goals and growth. Um, for the 24-25 school year, we're gonna continue our programming to include meaningful cultural events um, the native groups that give access to relevant curriculum for, for those students and initiatives such as post-secondary prep um, through college visits and career days. Um, we'll also maintain collaboration with district staff to ensure that the co compelling vision for Shakopee schools is realized. And so a lot of the collaboration is gonna um, come in the upcoming years. Um, in terms of participation, for the 23-24 school year at the elementary level, we had 64 students um, sign up and attend Native groups. Um, my goal is to increase this to 65. Um, and the reason for not such a big jump in that sense is we lost a lot of fifth graders going to middle school. Um, and then I only have a handful of kindergartners right now. Um, at the middle school level, we saw 81% participation at East and 84% participation at West. And that'll be the goal of 85% of both schools this year. The high school had a partition, participation rate of 62% and I aim for about 65% at the end of the school year. Um, when we're looking ahead, our programming is going to include um, family events such as the winter storytelling events, the native lacrosse events that we've held in the past, uh, drum and dance sessions both in collaboration with other school districts and on our own, um, having Nashi native games come out, and then field trips to culturally relevant sites, um, and then significant events such as the South of the River powwow that we collaborate with other school districts and the class of 2025 feather ceremony. Um, so we are particularly excited about the new smudging space. Thank you all for those who came out and saw the space in um, May. Providing a space for significant cultural practices for our Native students shows them that they're seen and that they're valued. And they were so proud. Um, this space will be used exclusively by Native students. Right now it is blocked. Um, the plan will be for first quarter, students will have access with me, so I can kind of teach them the expectations, what it's gonna look like. The goal is to have student leaders and ambassadors um, take other students out at appropriate times. And collaboration and engagement. Um, collaboration remains a huge priority for me this year. 
um, a group of secondary science teachers are partnering with the University of Minnesota with an energy, food, and outdoors curriculum that highlights Native knowledge. And so they started some of that training over the summer and they'll continue through a PLC to kind of get that embedded into our curriculum. Um, SMSC also continues to be a valuable partner for cultural experiences. Um, we plan on having the 2025 feather ceremony there again and tribal consultation and also being an academy champion. Um, additionally, I am currently undergoing training for what's called a blanket exercise. Um, this blanket exercise is an experiential learning tool that leads a group of up to 40 participants through 500 plus years of indigenous history that kind of focuses and highlights that relationship of European explorers, colonial settlers, and the federal and state governments, and it's all fact-based. Um, and so this exercise would help our teachers and staff really understand the historical trauma and the ongoing challenges faced by those tribal nations and our students. Um, the Understand Native Minnesota campaign from SMSC has also enhanced our literature to include indigenous perspectives within the classroom. Um, and many teachers, especially at the high school, have utilized this resource. There's a lot more books I'm seeing, which is amazing. Um, oh, and then the high school display and student education um, that is in progress. I'm working with um, Principal Kaliki right now to get that space and kind of get more feedback on what, what we want, what it will look like, um, and get student feedback as well. Um, to further grow our collaboration between the parent committee, um, I'll have regular meetings with them to just do our own programming needs, um, but we also want to include regular meetings with, available for district staff and teachers to be able to call on us and ask those questions that have, they have a little bit more wondering about. Um, it'll also help those conversations about the vision for a Dakota or Ojibwe language class and history class and what that might look like um, and just getting feedback from that parent committee. Um, in the previous years, the parent committee has been called the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee. Um, they are wanting to be referred to as NAPAC from now on, which means Native American Parent Advisory Committee. So just changing that wordage a little bit. Um, to further grow family engagement, I'll be sending out a survey in the first um, week or so of school to gather input on their top ways of how they want to get communication from me, um, but also giving them a voice and opportunity to share their enjoyment from our program the last few years, what they liked, um, and then we, better ways to assist students with their academics and with their learning. Um, and then I also want to kind of gauge their interest on joining our parent committee and or sharing cultural experiences with our native group and general classrooms. Um, so thank you all for your continued support and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Go ahead. I don't have questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to say Miigwech, so thank you. Um, I remember I, I was just thinking back to coming to visit you in your classroom after we knew that uh, you were going to take on this response, this leadership responsibility for last school year. And I know I was optimistic, excited, I had high expectations. Uh, you greatly exceeded those. You had an incredible first year in this role. In, you know, even there was stuff where, and I think I've shared this sometimes with board members, we, you know, well, I think we want to start doing more with the elementary students. And, and well, I, that's great. Um, when? Well, now, okay, that seemed, you know, are you sure? And uh, I just, I applaud your effort and, and the, the work that you've done, you know, on, on behalf of you know, our Native American students, but more importantly, on behalf of our community and building bridges and, and just bringing 
uh, so much positivity to the learning about the history and the culture of our state and, and our people. And uh, I'm, you know, we talk about, you know, just people are everywhere and let's get to know each other. And the more we get to know each other, uh, I think the better we all are. And I'm fascinated when I look at the data for this year, how evenly distributed uh, our American Indian students are among our, our five elementary schools. And, and so uh, certainly, you know, everywhere in our district and, and, you know, just continue to applaud your efforts and thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Next on our agenda um, are a series of uh, action items, uh, starting with item 8.1, Health Assistance Agreement. I'm here to present with our Director of Human Resources, Keith Gray. Welcome, Keith. Good evening. So um, we've been uh, negotiating with a fair number of our um, bargaining unit groups uh, over the summer, and this is uh, one of the groups that we uh, have a tentative agreement with. They have uh, approved it from their perspective, so this is before you guys to, for your review. Um, so with this, I've got a short summary there that for the, this particular group, they um, are in this tentative agreement as a $1.40 per hour increase for year one, and $1.18 for year two, and then their insurance increases are 6% um, in year one and 6% in year two for a total settlement of 7.29 over the two year span. So in our district, we have eight bargaining groups. Um, we had previously settled our teachers, also had settled with um, are an affiliated group, and then this is uh, a group on this next cycle uh, that starts with the first year this year. Any questions? Um, with the increase of a dollar forty and a dollar eighteen, is I'm assuming that not everybody makes the same amount of money, so people's percentages are going to be higher or lower based on the lower the. Yeah, Wait, it's the higher the increase. Because it's, because it's a dollar amount, it's the same for everybody across. But yeah, if you were calculating differences, there would be difference okay. based on just, where, I, where I am on the staff. Just to make sure. Thank you. Yeah. And, my, and what's the population of the staff in this part of the group? How many? Yeah, how many? Nine. Yeah. So there are, there are licensed um, right. practical nurses, our LPNs. We also have school nurses that um, work in some sense side, side by side with them in our larger buildings, right. like say the high school. Um, but like our elementary is all LPNs, um, for example. Well, and certainly a critical service. And then from a benchmarking perspective, you know, how does this align with other districts or just the industry as a whole? Or, you know, I mean, I think we've, we've made some we've made some improvements over the last couple of years um, to try to try to stabilize our group and I think we've done a fairly good job of that. It is a pretty stabilized group and obviously through that health situation we've been yeah. through, you want to call it a health situation. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> so that's a very big euphemism. But they were critical. I mean they were critical in helping us manage the mm -hmm. our, our situation and you know making sure everybody was safe and healthy. To the extent that's possible, so yes, this is, yeah. everybody's it's important. This is important. They really got to show their stuff, yeah, in a not so showy time. Well said. Uh, this is an action item, um, so I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the July 1, 2024 through June 30, 2026 Shakopee Health Assistance Contract as presented. I'll make a motion. Second. We have a motion by Peterson, a second by Brophy. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Next in our agenda is another action item, item 8.2, uh, MSBA resolution for QCOMP. And uh, Christy Peterson will present. All right, so um, in our uh, board book, 
you have in front of you the final resolution um, that we discussed at our um, last uh, leadership development meeting, I guess it was, mm -hmm. um, earlier this month. And again, um, some work has already been done on trying to get some uh, QCOMP funding. We know through the teacher negotiations that um, this is an area where we fall uh, behind uh, with our comparative 12 districts. Uh, we are the only one that does not have the QCOMP funding, which equates to about $2 million a year. We've been on a wait list with the Department of Education for approximately eight years. And so when you times that by $2 million, that's a lot of money that we have missed out on that could be used to help um, support our teachers in our district. So MSBA, as some of you know, have um, our delegate assembly coming up uh, in December. And this is the start of the process to include a resolution uh, that will be heard uh, in front of the MSBA board and then hopefully passed on to the delegate assembly to vote on to support in the next legislative session. Uh, and basically this resolution supports, um, in, in a nutshell, removing the uh, 27 school districts that are on the wait list to receive this uh, important funding in their districts. I know that the legislation that um, Representative Tapke presented uh, toward the end of the last legislative session was specific to Shakopee, but being that this is an MSBA resolution, um, it would be appropriate to include all 27 school districts that are on the wait list and not just identify um, and pull out Shakopee. So um, we will take the funding any way we can get it, either in an individual district or as part of the wait list uh, clearing. So um, I would ask for your support. Um, once the board would approve this resolution tonight, it will then be sent off to um, MSBA um, for consideration to be included in the delegate assembly um, process. This is a new process this year. Um, as far as typically any board member could bring forward a resolution, but this year boards have to approve resolutions as a whole before they get presented to the delegate assembly. So, um, question, when does the delegate assembly take place? It is the first weekend in December. And that, I think there's a hundred and I'm gonna be dragging my memory. I think there's 120 some delegates, maybe it's 130 delegates from across the state that come together. Um, and the delegates are selected based on your director districts and areas that have been identified by MSBA. And the number of delegates in each of those areas and districts is based on population um, in your school district. So obviously the bigger school districts will have a little bit more representation than smaller districts but they try to balance it out as much as possible. It's a, it's a tough, we've spent a lot of time reviewing those numbers this year to try to make some just something. Uh, Chris Smith, Jim is checking out the weather situation. Okay, thank you. Chris, you know what was when it was originally, like how much it was in 2000, was it 15, 16, eight years ago? Do you know, Mike? For district? Has it changed the, the amount that's in here? I think it's the same. So it's per, been per, basically per $2 million. Dollars. Right. I mean, yeah, for that number of students, it's uh, I think it's $191 sure. per pupil in okay. state aid and, right. uh, and then another. Yeah. There has been in the past. That calculator hasn't changed. Got it. There has been some uh, resolutions in the past of the delegate assembly to try to raise the cap for the funding, but not necessarily remove people from the wait list. And so it's really received no traction. Yeah. So this is a different resolution this year for the delegate assembly because it asks not for an increase, but to remove people from the wait list. And I'll, I'll say as someone who's participated in a couple of delegate assemblies now, I think this is a very uh, a strong resolution. It's worded well. Um, we've seen some, I, I, I I think personally, from my experience, it's a good change to move to a board approval, a local board approval, to get one of these into the delegate assembly um, list of considerations. Um, because we've seen some, some fairly weak ones get up to that delegate assembly level that results in a lot of conversation over something that's 
probably not going to pass because it's fairly fairly weak and pertains to maybe one district or um, is is very very narrowly focused or partisan. Uh, where this is, I, I think, very strongly worded, and and uh, I think we'll easily get to that level. Well, and Chair Smith, I echo everything you just said, and it, and this is equitable because it essentially removes all of those that are on the wait list mm -hmm. uh, and levels the playing field uh, because clearly there's a mismatch with districts that receive QCOM and those that do not. Mm -hmm. So I think agreed, it's a strong resolution, and I completely support this. And I think that one of the important pieces here as well is this is for the next legislative session, but in future years it would be to provide uh, full funding to all districts that may apply to the program because um, there might be some districts that want it that have not applied. So, Or possibly just review the whole process altogether and eliminate QCOMP right. and fund it in a different way. And, yeah, at least get the conversation at that level because as it currently stands, it's very inequitable. Just going to say why uh, I completely forgot what I was going to say, but uh, why penalize certain districts and reward other districts just because they eight years ago were they beat us to filling out some paperwork? It just doesn't make right long term sense uh, if equity is your your goal. I have a clarification question. So QCOMP is being funded by our taxes, correct? State taxes. State. Mm -hmm. Which is us. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. So yes. So it's not like a grant that they're coming up with. You're paying a tax and you're just not getting the money back. Right. And it was, uh, as Mr. Alder said, uh, districts had to apply, but the program let out money. So depending on the sequence in which your application was reviewed, you got a wait list because the QCOMP program is only funding those districts simply based on when they submit the application. Okay. So what you're saying is fund, fund it all. Like if the QCOMP's going to exist, all, all school districts should be entitled to receive it if they apply. That's what we're saying. I think it make it fair. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. Any further discussion? I will make a motion to uh, uh, approve this resolution as presented. I'll second it. We have a motion by Brophy and a second by Aldridge. Any uh, further discussion? And this is this a resolution, so we need to do a roll call. All right. Okay. Uh, Tiffany, can you please do the roll? Brophy? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Aldridge? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Mohammed? Valdez? Yes. All right, resolution passes six to zero. Thank you. All right, we are not gonna get out of here before the storm, but uh, that's not gonna stop me from keeping things moving here. Well, I got my windows up here, Smith. <laughs> All right, wow. that's, that's great. Uh, next on our agenda is another action item, item 8.3, uh, to uh, move the October board meeting to the 28th. And uh, Dr. Redman will present. Yeah, we've, we've uh, struggled with this calendar in October, and this should have been on probably a, a previous meeting. Um, Jim McCausic and I are attending Ford NGL training superintendent on that level of training. On October 21st, which was our original date, we moved uh, the October meeting to the 14th, missed that it's a, a state holiday. Uh, and so would ask the board to move that meeting to October 28th. Um, and we've looked at all the, you know, kind of the timing between the, the second meeting in September. Uh, our early meeting in November on November 4th is a board development meeting. So it, it still works for us to conduct business. Uh, and it's a, you know, other than kind of the uh, short notice, if you will, it's, it is the most appropriate date, all things considered. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, moving the October board meeting to the 28th as presented. Second. Motion by Peterson and a second by Johnson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
Next in our agenda is our final action item, item 8.2, the approval of policies. And uh, Ch Chad Johnson will present. Sure, so uh, these are the policy changes that we've reviewed um, at our last two meetings. So at this point, we're just here to um, vote on their approval. So I guess before we vote, do we have any questions? that the last few guys I summarized them as best I could the, the last couple times we um, discussed this but um, if you uh, they're all minor changes but if um, you would need it to take in the time to read them if you want to fully understand all of them kind of yeah just one point of clarification so 524 that the wrong the use of cell phones I know there's been actually a lot of dialogue and if I'm not mistaken there's even language of saying the school districts need to have a policy I don't know that it's prescriptive and what that looks like but this would certainly meet that expectation from an MSBA perspective is that yes 100% and then as long as we're on 524 you'll notice uh, a line in that you know in red yeah. Um, adding a new section 16 prohibiting the taking, creating, or recording images or video. Uh, that came from uh, you know uh, law firm Waltzberger, Squires and Mays. Um, you know, goof that up. But uh, we already had, as we were laying out that language, the language in that policy was already last school year in the middle school handbooks or something very similar. So just trying again to make sure that we're really clear uh, in terms of expectations and really focus, you know, in our district, we focus on that classroom learning time and, and prohibiting cell phones there unless they're part of the learning as directed by the teacher. And so, um, and, and we moved that direction in past years too, and just trying to make sure everything's synced up and, prime, and mostly clear. And I think we're there. We've, we've talked to the principals again, and I think we're ready to roll. Agreed. Good. No, and I, and I think to, to Mike's point, when you look at the language that we've had in the handbook even a year ago, we've had these things in place, and it becomes a local decision meeting at the buildings and the classrooms or how they want to go about it. And they definitely have the authority to do what they what they need to do, and I have not heard any complaints. I'll make a motion to approve the policies as presented. Second. We have a motion by Peterson, a second by Brophy. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, that takes care of the action items. Next on our agenda is uh, item 9.1, a district update. Uh, Dr. Redmond will present. Yeah. All right, that's a train whistle, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, our district update, really appreciate Tiffany Olson and Amber Trudenik and Communications did a, a lot of the prep work on this. Yeah, it's been a busy summer. You know, we've served over 3,500 meals to kids in our district uh, at Pearson Early Learning Center. Uh, we've had other summer programs that have served over, you know, over 900 students, K-12. Uh, and so just really cool things happening in the summer. Uh, one of those cool things is kinder camp is continuing, trying to, to give our, you know, our, our students entering our elementary schools an opportunity uh, for a really kind of a cool, you know, get to know you experience, get through some of those, those uh, initial jitters and uh, hopefully start the, the regular school year and uh, even better than they would otherwise. Uh, and then we're back at it. You know, last week was new teacher week. A lot of great things happening there. Today, uh, Mr. McClausic and I, I think we made it to seven of the 10 schools trying just to pop in and say, hey, welcome back because our teachers are, are back. Uh, they're back at school this week getting ready to uh, kick off the uh, school year a week from Tuesday. 
And then uh, a lot of things happening, kind of the community connections here in August. Uh, really appreciate the work with Engage um, uh, and some of those pieces. I'm trying to read those again here. We had the Academies of Shock be, you know, hosted the Chamber Wake Up event. Uh, the Welcome Center, they'll, they're going on the road at times, uh, you know, at the Shakopee, City of Shakopee Summer Carnival, Rhythm on the Rails. Uh, Community Ed has just held recently, last week, their very popular vehicle fair. Uh, and then the groundbreaking for Scott County's new development, uh, which will be called Legacy Central, honoring the legacy of that area, the legacy of some of their long-serving employees, and then also the name Central, the legacy of the Central School Building. And then uh, you've got this on your, you know, another copy of this, if you didn't get it in your mailboxes yet, but Education Forward has, has been out in the mail. Uh, lots of great information. Uh, and then, you know, trying to go deeper, trying to provide more. And if as Tiffany flips to that next slide, um, oop, did it say, I, I might have been reading this from somewhere else, but, uh, oh, it's on the bottom there. Is that uh, the new annual schedule? Yes. Uh, that, yeah, I got that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the third and fourth week of August, last week of October, last week of January, and the end of April. And so trying to kind of fill in a, at least some of that gap that uh, was left with Shakti Valley News ending, you know, ending production in our community. School board elections coming up. Uh, three school board seats on the November 5th general election ballot. We had three candidates uh, filed by the deadline. Uh, and none of them withdrew in the 48 hours after the deadline. Those are uh, Jeff Smith, Tim Brophy, and Nick Zittick. And again, capital projects levy is also on that November 5th ballot, uh, often referred to as safety and technology levy, tech levy, technology levy. Uh, and just again, I, I'm sure I sound like a broken record, but maybe when we're talking about a renewal or something kind of, you know, going round and round or something, uh, this is a you know a continuation of the capital project levy passed in 2015 for a period of 10, 10 years. Should this be renewed by the taxpayers, the, the new capital projects levy would be continuing the same levy, the same terms, the same tax rate for another 10 years. Uh, and you have a handout. I'm, I'm not going to read through this, but uh, at your places this evening trying to encapsulate, uh, trying to, to put it into a two-page format. Uh, again, trying to communicate, trying to inform our community members really has begun in earnest now and uh, trying to find that attention in, uh, in, in light of all the other elections being held on November 5th. Uh, and part of that uh, communication plan, we have a community forum scheduled uh, 6 p.m. September 17th, Studio Theater at Shakopee High School. Uh, all community members are welcome to attend. No RSVP required. Um, that is a Tuesday. 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 Yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Otherwise, that would be somewhere else. Wednesday. That's it. Any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Reppin? Yeah, I'll just say see great, great work on all these materials. Uh, very nice. Yeah. And Jim, you did move your vehicle closer to the building to shuttle us to our vehicles when we're done, right? I, I did that. Wow. <laughs> I parked the because my face is sore from all of the stuff that flew into it. It was, <laughs> it was weird. I'm sure it's better now out there. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Evan. Uh, next on our agenda is item 9.2, the uh, superintendent annual evaluation summary. Um, and we we have a, a summary up on the board. And Keith is back up. Did you did you want to discuss it all, Keith? Or well, I'll, I'll just point what, what we what we've done the last several years is is sent out the survey, what I might call 360 degree feedback. <laughs> Uh, school board completes it, principals complete it, and then uh, district leadership completed. So what you see on the board are, you know, are 
ratings, one to five, five being great, um, are the best you can get. Um, and then, uh, you know, all the way down to, down to one. Um, all these are obviously up in that great area. Um, I also have previous year, last year, and this year. So you see some comparison. It's really a web like a graph. Um, you want to tend to have things on the outside. Yeah, and this is a roll up of all three of those different groups. Um, yeah. So the principals, district leadership, and the board. Um, yeah, you can see the visual re representation, but then the individual numbers are up above. And there's one additional category on the, the, the latest survey, the equity and inclusion category. Uh, but you can see every category, um, the overall group numbers uh, from the last survey to this one have gone up. I didn't see any. Uh, any exception in there uh, that, I, that I noticed. So it's always always good to see that see that progress. Yeah. And then the final slide is really some summarization of people who are able to add individual narrative to uh, different responses, and that's on the last page. I don't know if you want to review that or not, but you you all have that access to that. Nice to see the the positive trend um, in your in your tenure with us. Um, we look forward to those numbers continuing to go up. <laughs> um, any any other comments or thoughts? Um, oh, our next step then would be for the uh, the personnel committee. Uh, so Caroline and and uh, Christy and I will uh, get together um, and talk about goals going forward based on on these results. Um, I think our next scheduled personnel meeting isn't for a couple of months yet, so we may want to meet separately before that. Um, so we'll be in talks on a good time to do that with, and with Dr. Redman as well. Please. Yeah, if I might, I just uh, kind of for the record, if you will, um, you know, we, we share that inverted pyramid from Blanchard and we talk about supporting students. Uh, I get to work with great people, and, and truly, they're the ones doing. You know, they're the ones doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones doing great work. Um, you know, and so the the better they do, I think that uh, you know, the better people feel about me. But uh, certainly, it's a testament to the work of lots and lots of other people are doing some really great things in service to our students, their families, and our community each and every day. So I appreciate uh, all the great people I get to work with, and so. Thanks to them. Real quick on that. Um, when you had your interview six years ago, you said the smartest person in the room is the room. And that has stuck with me for six years just because it's a great line. And one thing that's probably underrated in your review is your credibility is genuine. genuine. Being genuine is an underrated term. Also the cheat. But it's a very underrated you know, because I think to find genuine people who are genuine is such a rarity these days. So, thank you. No, I've, I've shared this with you before. I, I enjoy what I do. It's, I'm not saying it's not hard work, it's not challenging, it is. Um, but it's the right work, and uh, I love getting up every day and, and you know, coming to work on behalf of the kids and uh, our community and uh, you know our school district, and so I feel very fortunate to, to be able to do it, do that. And um, yeah. yeah, when you get right down, I'm a pretty simple guy. We're gonna we're gonna tell you where we want to go, and we're gonna do our best to get there. And we're gonna tell you when we're making progress, and we're gonna tell you when we're not. And you know, and again, if, if we're all moving in the same direction, uh, we're doing good things for kids. Then. I think I'll just add to Joe's um, comment because I, I was in that interview as well six years ago because we were running for school board right. at that time. Um, it was kind of crazy. But um, yeah, I, I think that from where we were at that point in time when you joined us to where we are today, 
is a testament to that leadership that you have brought to our district and that stability. And I think we, we talk about our compelling vision um, and a lot of it has to go, a lot of it goes back to implementing the systems that were not in place in our district. And it takes time and those systems also bleed over into the community and the engagement that you have had with our community has been so positive. And I, because I'm involved in a lot of MSBA stuff, I hear it from so many people that Shakopee is very lucky to have the superintendent that they have. And I, I share that with you only because I, I honestly hear that a lot at a lot of different conferences that I go to. See a lot of people from around the state and just that's a, t a testament to what you have done in the community with other education associations at the Capitol. Um, you're always willing to listen, help people in tough situations, regardless if it's related to Shakopee schools or not. And um, that's just, it's, it's a unique quality that you bring to our district that not very many people um, have. So thank you for everything you've done for us. Everybody. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Thank you, Keith. Good news, temperature's going to be lower tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it might be lower in an hour. Yeah. It's probably lower right now. Next on our agenda is item 10, committee reports and other information. Um, let's start with Caroline. Well, for community engagement, we had Mary Hernandez to be present come talk to us just about the program in general and how they're doing it. Just all the great things that the work the community has done with uh, Picasa. Um, and then we talked about, you know, upcoming events like um, chats, you know, for maybe um, school, school board chats and signing up for activities uh, for back to school. Thank you, Joe. I was actually there too, and yeah, pretty much all the same stuff from that. Um, we had finance and facilities meetings. Uh, we got an update on facility uh, construction throughout the summer. Most everything will be ready to go. There's a small couple of hiccups, but it won't affect us. school starting next week believe it or not and i don't i just cannot believe that uh summer is uh over and i just want to say good luck to all the teachers and the paras and the bus drivers and the students and just everybody involved in uh in, 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 in for everybody just to have a magnificent year awesome. and michelle left i was gonna say as for her senior year <laughs> thank you joe uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, finance and facilities committee um, and on the uh, the constructive feedback committee. Um, yeah, just looking forward to the start of the school year. Christy, um, Southwest Metro. We had a meeting last Tuesday. It was our first meeting with a new superintendent. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work uh, is being done. Uh, I just talked about systems, but. A lot of systems there um, needed some work and enhancements and so there's been a lot of work um, being done within the district to support the students needs as well as our staff and then also just improving communication health organization including with the board um, so just a lot of great things going on there um, happy to say that uh, Southwest Metro was the first uh, teacher apprentice program in the state of Minnesota that's up and running and that is associated with I believe Mankato State University um, so there was a big celebration I believe somewhere in Edina at Mankato State or something on Thursday um, so that that's a program that's uh, in conjunction with several different organizations including the state um, to uh, bring paras or other interested parties that want to be a teacher to help them achieve their licensure to become a teacher um, and so it's kind of like a grow your own type of a program so that was exciting um, participated in the vehicle fair last week and if there's any positive hope for enrollment growth 
there were a lot of uh, kids there that are not in school yet. So if there's, Keith and I were having a discussion about that, um, a lot of young families, and when we talked to people, they, their kids were not in school yet. So we've got a year or two to go, and then a lot of little babies. So hopefully that's a positive trend for us. And um, let's see here, what else have I my notes? Um, as of last week, Shakopee will be, it was decided that Shakopee will be hosting the Student School Board Conference again in October. Um, and the date is yet to be determined, but I believe it will be either October 2nd or 9th. Uh, so uh, more information to come on that, but that was a late last week development that they asked us to host again. Uh, so uh, I think there's a meeting next week to start that planning. And then the last thing is we had uh, Representative Tapke here next uh, week of September 8th. I will be in Washington, D.C. doing federal advocacy work with MSBA. And um, they are, uh, there's an education bill for funding um, that is out there that the House has presented that will actually cut funding for public schools. Um, so that's uh, a difficult thing that we are going to be talking about. And, but the Senate bill does not cut funding. So obviously we support the Senate bill, but so that'll be one of the things that we'll be talking to our uh, delegation out in Washington, D.C. So that's all I have. Thank you. Well, I don't have nearly as much. <laughs> Joe mentioned finance facilities. Uh, we learned a little bit about the inner workings of HVAC systems, and, <laughs> you know, how to operate fans manually if need be. Uh, but great work and team are uh, doing to uh, get ready for the, the school year. Uh, uh, we saw a couple of the, you know, uh, events to celebrate the groundbreaking for the Legacy Central, participated in that. Mm -hmm. The welcome back to new tour, the, the welcome to new teachers. Uh, was uh, just how it's always great to you know to see the excitement in the room um, and uh, just the support of the, the leadership team and the, and the staff. Um, if you remiss if I didn't mention we had the first mountain bike race of the season. Uh, it was in Alexandria over the weekend, uh, a little toasty, but it was uh, hosted at, of all places, Lake Brophy. You can oh. look it up. Wow. So, yes. That's all I've got. Thank you. Tiffany? Uh, I just have two quick items. I would like to second Christy's comments about Dr. Redmond as well as Joe's, especially with the genuine component, and also would add Mr. McClausich to that too. I work very closely with both of them, and I would sincerely echo everything that was said today. So I just wanted to share that. And also for events, as Caroline mentioned, we have a lot going on. We have secondary back to school events this week, and then you have Connect and Assess and Connect and Celebrate next week. And also the district event that Mr. McClausage mentioned earlier, which is on Thursday for all of our staff. And uh, what Christy mentioned in terms of donations, it's absolutely incredible. We reached out, you know, hey, we'd like to provide breakfast for staff, or hey, we'd like to provide some gifts for years of service that you ask for one thing and they give you 10 times as much and it is all different folks that are providing the support our students and we have shipments of school supplies coming in to make sure families in need have what their students need to be successful in the classroom so it's really enjoyable to be able to see that. Thank you. Jim? First of all, I'd just like to say it's not lost on me that Dr. Redmond is driving a motor car with Kansas license plate <laughs> as we wait for the, you know, whatever comes next. Um, uh, but more importantly, uh, we, we had our annual back to school meeting with our school resource officers today. It was fantastic to have Captain Nordvit in along with our the three gentlemen who will be in our schools along with Anna Christensen who's now uh, handling our, our general security measures and then all of our Secondary administrators and assistant principals talk about practices, procedures, next steps, and just make sure we're all on the same page heading into the year. Each year, the, the meeting only gets more pleasant. We appreciate the partnership and the communication that we have with the Shopkeep Police Department. Thank you. I have one thing to add. 
the marching band is uh, marching Thursday at the State Fair, and then they're also going to be on Karen Lovin. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So I'm going on Thursday with my um, employee who's here from Australia who's very excited to go to the fair. So hopefully we'll see the band march. Uh, we'll be there by then. So. Awesome, yes. Great, thank you. Dr. Remy, you get the last word. Do you think my rental car with uh, Kansas plates is better in tornadoes? Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> that hopefully it has something that keeps it on the ground? As long as don't I was thinking balance. cause effect. Cause effect? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's why you were, you were going the optimistic direction with that rather than and rather now you have me, being a tornado magnet. Now yeah. you got me thinking, how many vehicles do I have outside right now? I'm <laughs> sure the truck at the auto body shop is indoors, right? No. I, uh, it seems to be let down. Yeah, I, I don't think we got more than uh, an inch of rain in that last 20 right minutes. Right outside now. Yes. Fine. Thank you for everything this evening. Thank you. Uh, and then our, our last item is the uh, the upcoming meetings and important dates. Uh, Tiffany, are there any you want to bring attention to on here? Uh, we do, uh, as I mentioned, secondary. We have East and West have their open houses both at the same time. And then you have Takata and Shakti High School. So lots of great things going on there. So it's a good time to make it. We have the form to sign up on. We're ensuring the school is ready for you. And I'll send you an email or a text. I'll probably do both just to make sure you know where you're going. Thank you. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Aldrich and a uh, second by Peterson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Meeting adjourned.